Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 372 for April 7th of 2017. Nothing's ironic about Hyundai's Ionic. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. You know, it's opening day tomorrow, and there are ice pellets falling out of the sky right now. Yeah, you're, you're talking about opening day for Tigers baseball. That's right. It's, I, why don't they push this back a month? You'd this think. always happens. Unbelievable. I've been to opening day in my long underwear, and I've been there in short pants and flip-flops. You know, it, it, that's it's how it goes. It's insane. Absolutely. So we got to let everybody know Chris Pockert from Roadshow at CNET is with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Yeah, good to have you here. And our special guest today is Michael Bryan, the Vice President of Corporate and Digital Planning at Hyundai Motor America. We're going to have to get into the digital part about it. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, one, it's good to be here today. Thank you very much. And I grew up in Chicago, but, you know, I got used to no snow in California, mm -hmm. I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> it is snowing now, I have to say. And you brought a car with you. We've yeah. got a Hyundai and Ionic in the studio with us. And is this car on sale yet? You guys have started selling them. We Ionic just did. started selling this car today. And for us, it's, uh, it's just a great opportunity to go beyond where hybrids, electrified vehicles have gone in the past. So when you think about uh, the current situation, less than 3% of the entire light vehicle market are electrified vehicles. And that's after... Uh, these cars have been on sale since 1997. And uh, when you think about it, you know, all the emphasis on greenhouse gas reduction, all the emphasis on reducing the carbon load of uh, personal mobility, you think we'd be doing better. And so when our engineers started out to think about this car, the focus was on how do we get beyond selling a car for people that want a hybrid vehicle, but instead just want a great car. And so when you look at people that consider new compact class cars, which this is, which so it competes with a, uh, a Hyundai Elantra or a Ford Focus or a, a Toyota Corolla or a Honda Civic. Uh, when you look at that market, over one million people come to market every year and they think about an electrified vehicle, hybrid vehicle, but they end up not buying it. Why? Well, usually it's, uh, there's concerns about reliability, there's concerns about cost of maintenance, there's concerns about uh, an image of lack of power, uh, an image that uh, they're not very exciting to drive, they're boring, uh, they're, for, they're cars for people that don't like cars, and so they end up buying something else. And so the whole uh, focus of this car was to make it a car that was comparable and competitive to contemporary compact class cars, so it would drive as well as a, a Cruze or a Civic or a Focus or an Elantra and give that same kind of driving behavior. And we did that through a number of different things. Uh, we're the first in this category to offer a dual clutch transmission. And honestly, I believe that our engineers have found something that's really a, an elegant engineering solution. The perfect marriage of a DCT and a gasoline engine, I think, is with an electric motor assist, which you get with hybrid, because you give up it's the, the torque, torque converter. converter right? You give up the torque converter, and so what does everybody always talk about with a DCT? They say, well, they don't launch so well. Well, guess what? When you marry a DCT with an electric motor, now you have excellent launch characteristics, just like you have with a torque converter or torque multiplication you get with a conventional uh, planetary gear automatic transmission. So we overcome that issue of start off, you know, launch uh, feeling, that G feeling you get when you push on the gas. And then the seven speed, or the six, I'm sorry, six speed DCT gives you a very nice uh, shifting feeling. It, it shifts like a nice sporty car. It feels like a normal car. You know, some of the other hybrids in the market, people use the term motorboating or slipping feeling. It doesn't feel like a normal car, so people feel like it's not quite the car that they were expecting. And so people avoid the area that, this area of the market for those reasons. So we, we really focused on making it drive like a contemporary compact car, not drive like the best uh, uh, hybrid car. But in fact, by doing so, we end up with the best hybrid car. But it's a car that allows you to choose among many cars rather than just other hybrid alternatives. All right, so, so, so the best hybrid car. How is this the best hybrid car? 
Well, it has the highest fuel economy of any vehicle that has a gas nozzle on it. Okay. So 58 combined. Uh, we're two better than the industry leader. That's better than the Prius. Yes. You, you call it the industry leader. I'll, I'll, for our audience, I'll let them know. So our engineers worked very, very hard on that. And they did it through a tremendous amount of effort in terms of a lot of small details in terms of uh, whether it's drag reduction, it's frictional road load reduction, uh, it's weight reduction. Uh, we have aluminum, a hood, and, uh, and a rear a hatchback. Uh, we've done a lot of things to reduce weight beyond just the metals. Uh, in the interior, we use volcanic rock for the interior plastics. So volcanic rock, if you've ever seen or felt volcanic rock, is very lightweight, like featherweight. It's because it's full of hot gases that were cooling when the lava was coming out of the volcano. And by using this lava rock, it creates a lot of porous airspace. But the benefit is it makes it feel very luxurious. It feels like a very expensive material you would have in your kitchen or your, or your wait a uh, library. Minute. You're saying it's made out of volcanic rock yeah, or so just it's, like It's soybean-based resins mixed with volcanic rock. How, really? That How do you arrive at that rock. solution? <laughs> I mean, who, who, you know, in your materials department or in, in your buying department comes up and says, you know what we need is volcanic rock. The challenge was, it was so high in terms of how to create our first generation dedicated vehicle, dedicated electrified vehicle, and how do we have something that will bring people to our showrooms, uh, some compelling thing. So we've, we had a target to be as best we could in terms of fuel economy and as best as we could in terms of having a regular compact car, competitive compact car driving dynamic. And so we had to make all these extraordinary pushes and choices in order to get the lightweight we needed, as well as the drivability we needed to get the fuel economy that, that delivers that number that you heard. Huh. You talked some about consumer confusion, misunderstanding what a hybrid is, how it performs, and you know how it can benefit consumers. Um, but with this vehicle, you've got three different powertrains, which is, hasn't been done in the industry before. You've got a pure electric, you've got a plug-in hybrid, and you've got a conventional hybrid. Uh, how do you get out there with the consumers and explain to them what these different technologies are? Or, or does the vehicle do that for you? One word is choice. So this car will naturally appeal to people that are looking for very low cost of ownership and people that want to do their part for greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, but what it allows them to do is choose their level of uh, engagement. If you're fully engaged, go for the EV and you get the most efficient EV available ever in the US market. So people forget about efficiency, they really do. Uh, this car, for example, is 32% more efficient than a Tesla Model S, 32%. Now, when you plug into the wall, you don't see that, but at the end of the day, 67% of our electricity today in the United States comes from fossil fuels. So frankly, the tailpipe is just somewhere else. Uh, and so if we're really serious about reducing greenhouse gases, we have to think about it well to wheel. And so efficiency is going to become important. It's not so important now. Of course, the industry and our buyers are focused on range. But as we get better and better at the range solution, efficiency will become more important. So, so, so what, what does efficiency mean in the context of this car? Well, technically, it's 136 MPGE, which is better than the all-new Bolt. It's better than the new uh, uh, Golf. It's better than uh, the Focus EV. It's much better than uh, Tesla products. So it's, uh, it's a number, but what it really is, is it's, it's the fuel economy rating for an electric vehicle. Or electric so, so, vehicle. so the energy that goes in is more efficiently processed, so it spins the wheels it better takes less, than... For the pure EV model, the Ionic EV, the Ionic EV takes less electricity for it to go down the road a mile. And what's the, the driving range, fully charged? It's 124 miles. Okay. But that's still an issue, right? I mean, I would think for a lot of people, even though it's very efficient... People are scared about the short driving range of so many electrics. Well, you know, over 85% of the drivers today drive less than 40 miles a day. Well, I know, I know the argument, Mike. Everybody's known that. But you, you talk to people and they go, and you say, it'll go 125 miles. That's it. Boy, I don't want that. Even though it would easily meet 99% of their driving needs. No doubt. Uh, but I will say this, that just like today, I could buy a 707 horsepower Hellcat or I could buy, you know, 138 horsepower compact car, there's going to be a wallet and there's going to be a taste for everything in the middle. So just like customers today choose between a four-cylinder and a V6 and a V8 engine, in the future, customers are going to decide based on what they want and what they can afford and what matches their lifestyle. There's going to be a large range of, of ranges, 
for electric vehicles. There'll be electric vehicles that are very expensive with very good range characteristics, and there'll be ones that are more affordable that'll probably have less range. But the most important thing is this. Unlike a gasoline-powered car, when the gasoline is, ex is exhausted, the fuel tank is negligible weight. With the battery EV, the batteries weigh the same amount, whether they're fully charged or dead. Mm -hmm. So think about this. When you drive an EV that has a large battery pack with a great range, that's like dragging a trailer around for the life of the car. A trailer you cannot unhitch from the car. And so you have the road load and you have the losses, the efficiency losses that go along with dragging all that weight around. So at some point in the future, people will find more value in the maximization of efficiency that comes with something that's right sized for them. Because it's easy for engineers. It's very easy to put more batteries in a car. Not a problem. It's just an issue of can customers afford the extra batteries? And do they want to take the compromise in terms it takes longer to charge? Mm -hmm. No matter how you charge it, it's going to take longer. And it's going to be less efficient because of all that extra weight that's parasitic that you drag around for the entire life of the vehicle. You can't put it away in a closet somewhere. That's good. So let's talk Ionic, this, the car that you've got here, the, the hybrid. What's the price on this? So this car, uh, I don't know the exact price because you caught me off guard. I should have brought in because I, I forget the okay, freight more amount. or less, more but or less. Basically, it's going to be in the low 20s. So Ooh, for this car. Uh, that's pretty cheap. It's a very good value, so we tried to have a price that would certainly catch everybody's attention, and we're a better value than some of you know, the, the industry leaders again. <laughs> we tried to make sure that we were, uh, we, we were a much better value in that respect, and so certainly we'll get a good score in that department. Uh, and we try, we'll try and do that with all three models. Uh, the EV is going to have a very good price as well as the plug-in, and so we want to make sure that we offer you know, what we're known for, which is very good value, but also offer a very high level of feature content for the car. So it has a lot of standard equipment in the car that you know, it would be a little surprising for most customers. So it's very well equipped. So, so Mike, like the industry leader, um, this, this is basically a purpose-built platform, right? I mean, you have the Sonata hybrid, but that's a Sonata with a hybrid powertrain. This Ionic is something different that you guys have just clean sheeted? Well, think about it for a minute. So with many vehicles, you have powertrain options. And uh, so if a, a vehicle is designed to take a V8, a V6, and a 4, that engine space has to be sized for the V6, and it's just a ton of wasted space for the other two engines. And that wasted space could become cabin space or trunk space. So we learned about this when we developed the last generation Sonata, and we made the decision to not develop the car with a V6 engine. And we turned all of that extra space, so you look at an Accord or Camry where you have around 20% of the total mix of those cars are V6, the other 80 plus percent of the mix are fours. Well, those 80 plus percent of the customers are, are given away space for the 20% to enjoy. And so for them, they get a smaller cabin. So for that last generation Sonata, we have the only EPA full size cabin in the industry for a mid-sized car. We learned the same thing back then and applied it to this car. And the idea is, is that an electrified powertrain is a totally different package than a gasoline powertrain. And so we focused less space on the engine compartment and more space on the cabin, and therefore we have a much bigger interior cabin space than our competitors. Hmm. Uh, more than the Prius, more than the Prius Prime, the, uh, the plug-in hybrid. And so we, can, we, can, we have a full five-passenger seating for our plug-in versus the Prime, which is only four-passenger seating. And the Prime is the one that has the greatest range of... That's the plug-in plug 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 yeah. hybrid model. So, and it was all about creating a dedicated platform to reallocate the space between passenger, cargo, and powertrain. So there's been sort of this vacillating school of thought on when you design these vehicles visually um, and how the customer interacts with them. Um, for a while it was you have to have the most distinct shape possible because people want to know that they're, you know, they want everybody to know that you're driving the greenest possible vehicle and, you know, um, you've got that halo around your head. Um, and then it sort of vacillated back to, well, we need more people to embrace this and so we're going to, you know, mainstream it and you're going to have things like this and not a hybrid. This seems to be a much more you know, visually conservative or, you know, vehicle than uh, something like the Prius or the Prius Prime. Um, I happen to find it a lot more attractive as a result of that. I think the, the Prius and the Prime are kind of out in the woods stylistically. But I wanted to know, was that a conscious decision? Did you have to do, um, you know, more conservative design outside or a more rational shifter, things that are more familiar to people? Well, I think... When you look at any new product lifecycle or any new technology lifecycle, of course, the early buyers are innovators, and they want everybody to know they're innovators. And so you could use the term badge of honor. 
So, you know, during the early, early part of a life cycle where people want to be known for their choice, they're taking a chance, they're doing, they're stretching themselves. Uh, this kind of badge of honor design r r resonates well. But when you think about that 1.1 million people that thought about buying an electrified product, ended up buying a conventional gasoline product, they're looking for a great value and great transportation. And so our, our goal was to have something that looked fabulous, but it didn't necessarily shout, I'm electrified. So, so basically, you want to mainstream this, so you make it look like a car that... Now, when you think about, uh, when you think about the march towards 2025 at 54.5 fleet MPG, that's 4.7% improvement per year. The auto industry is a normal... Has never done that. They do that on a life cycle. So product life cycle is about five years. The industry averages about 5% fuel economy improvement at that life cycle change with an all new product. We gotta be at five times faster pace of improvement in order to meet the 2025 goal. And uh, to do that, we have to make a car that has mass appeal, that has big volume potential, core volume potential, not niche volume potential. And I think the badge of honor is great for inter introducing a new technology in the market, but is it great for volume uh, uh, scale up? And maybe not. So, so I, I, we we got to take a quick break here, Gary. Save your thought. We're coming back to it because we, we got a lot more questions to get to. But you know, it takes money to support a show like this. This is an important show for the industry, and we've got to give a shout out to our friends at Lear for making this show possible. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're, ta we're back talking with Michael Bryan, and I rudely cut you uh, off, Gary. <laughs> to, the, to the point of improvement, so if we were to look at an Elantra and compare it to the performance and the efficiency you're getting out of the Ionic, what sort of improvement does that represent? This car uh, ties the world's and industry best in terms of thermal efficiency for a gasoline combustion engine at 40%. So we're Explain that a bit, because... Uh, I don't fully understand. Well, I'm not an that. engineer, but very simply speaking, uh, when you burn gasoline, you create heat and work. And the work is the part that turns the wheel, and the heat's the part that comes out of the radiator. And the more of the energy that can be driven to the wheels and less of it driven to the radiator, the more thermally efficient your engine is. And so, you know, we just a few years ago had engines that were in the low 20s. That was typical of the auto industry. So basically, the industry has been able to double the ability to turn gasoline energy into work which is a huge accomplishment when you think about it. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing is how do you reduce all the frictional and aerodynamic loss? So this also has ties the industry for the world's best uh, CD or coefficient of drag. So it takes the least amount of energy. What are you claiming for this car? I think it's uh, 0.24, mm -hmm. which ties, I believe, with the Model S. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've reduced the aero drag on the car. So at freeway speeds, it takes the less amount of energy to push it down the road. And then the third thing is all the frictional losses or road load losses. So that's tire. We worked with Michelin to develop a special tire for this car that maximizes not just low rolling resistance, which is certainly what we want to do, but customers don't really appreciate that except at the gas pump or the plug-in for the EV. Uh, but what they really appreciate is good driving characteristics. So Michelin worked very hard with us to make sure that the driving characteristics weren't uh, diminish to the point where it would become a problem for the car. We want, again, to have a car that's comparable to any gasoline product in terms of uh, driving dynamics. And so to get a good low rolling resistance and good driving dynamics was certainly a big challenge for tire development. Hyundai engineers obviously were able to even more greatly accomplish what you were saying, though, in terms of going to 2025 by doing this car. Well. We have to be thinking about volume products that are going to get us towards right. that goal. I think it's really the, the end game for all of us. We have to be thinking about every category of product we're working on is how do we find technologies that customers will easily accept and they'll, they'll use their hard-earned money to pay for and it won't disrupt their lives in any way. How can you have a product that will do that? And that was, that's part of the story about having three flavors of Ionic. So the customer can choose 
which flavor best, best matches their, their pocket book as well as their, their driving style, what they do every day. Will you market this car, this version right here, as a hybrid? It will be marketed as a hybrid, but we're going to more market it as a better car. So really the campaign <laughs> behind this car is better. See, I got a theory that one of the reasons why the green car st segment is stuck at 3% is that Americans actually do not want a hybrid. That's my theory. And I find it intriguing that your, your cousin company, Kia, is largely marketing the Nero without mentioning it being a hybrid in its television ads. Now, there are a couple of hybrid badges on it, and they give you a quick flash of one of those badges in the TV ads. But they're just going, hey, Kia Nero, really good, and hey, by the way, it gets 42 miles per the gallon. Why not just not even mention the fact that it's a hybrid. Yeah, you may find when we have our marketing campaign launch, we're not too far away from that. Again, the campaign is going to be focused on better, a better car. Uh, hybrid will be mentioned at some point, but it's not going to certainly be a highlight. I, of the I'll, give you a, I'll give you a suggestion. You ought to do a test someplace. No hybrid badges, no mention of it being a mm. hybrid. And just, mm. just see what happens. That's an interesting but, thought. And, and my other question is, you're going with this as this is the better car, and it happens to have a, a pretty similar package size inside and out to another car that you already have in your lineup, and the pricing is not terribly dissimilar there, you know, to the Elantra. Um, this is more expensive, but how do you avoid cannibalization? Do you care? Um, you know, how do you, how do you avoid taking sales away? Well, there's always going to be cannibalization, and the question is, how do you cover those pockets of the market where buyers are looking for unique characteristics? So. Obviously, this is a hatchback design, so it'll appear it'll appeal to people that are more focused on utility and having more carrying capacity. Uh, we did some things extra with this car to try and overcome the image of electrified vehicles. For example, our normal, uh, uh, except for the uh, Elantra Sport model, which has a fully independent multi-link rear suspension, uh, the other cars have a, a, a twist beam rear axle, uh, which is certainly great for a good affordable price, but not the most dynamic car in the world. Uh, for this car, uh, the Ionic Hybrid, we have the full independent rear suspension set up to really overachieve in, in the potential for better dynamics and better NVH. So we tried to overachieve in some areas here to overcome, as you mentioned, there's, there could be, and there in fact is, resistance to the word hybrid. Hybrid conjures up these images of slow and too costly to maintain and it won't last long and, and so on and so forth. And we tried to overcome this not just with the car itself, but with other things that we're doing. So we're still the only manufacturer that offers a lifetime battery warranty for all three Ionics, the, the Ionic Hybrid, the Ionic Plug-in, and the Ionic Electric has a full lifetime battery warranty. So uh, we're trying to eliminate any concern about cost of ownership or what happens to your cell phone after it's a couple years old, you're busy for looking for a charging port everywhere you go. So we're trying to eliminate those concerns as these cars are, are kept in the fleet. And it's not just about the first owner, we're trying to make sure that you know people uh, think about this car as a long-term long, long -term value. And in fact, uh, Automotive Leasing Guide ALG gave us a remarkable uh, residual value as we launched this car. Because of that, that warranty? I'm not sure, they don't tell us all the things that fit into their ingredients or their equation, but I believe uh, we have an ALG a figure, of, I think believe it's 44%, which is uh, quite remarkable for a car of this area. It's uh, much better than our competitors. Well, that's uh, a good point because 44% isn't all that great of a number, but for a hybrid, it really is. It's an excellent number. So uh, when you look at every competitor, we've, uh, we've ended up in a much better spot. And that's going to help in terms of leasing for those customers who want to lease. It'll make a better price for them, a better value. It'll also be better down the road when you trade the car in. And so we're, we're trying to make it uh, the total cost of ownership uh, something that people can really appreciate and make part of their purchase decision. So, Mike, to, to John's point about people not being all that keen on buying hybrid cars, and um, there's, there's the other factor now of comparatively inexpensive gas prices. Um, the leading car in the segment I see for the month of March compared to last year is down 19%. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that a concern to you, the fact that people seem to be not buying these cars because of the additional aspect of inexpensive gasoline? You know, in fact, you're right. And in fact, gasoline is predicted to be fairly stable for the next couple of years. We're not expecting to see a big change in gas prices. 
that said, there's always going to be a sedan market and there's always going to be a CUV market and there's always going to be a pickup in a van market. And, and really the big concern and the challenge for the auto industry is how do we increase the mix of these products, whether it's in a CUV platform or it's in a car platform. Uh, you know, we got to get way above 3% to be working our way towards the government mandated, you know, 54.5. So it's really a mix issue more than a gas price issues. How, is we, how do we get more of these products in the mainstream consideration list? And uh, in order to do that, they have to be comparable in every way to a, to a gasoline facing product. So uh, the compact car market's over 2 million, 2.1 million vehicles a year. That's, that's a good sized market. So I think what our dream is, is how do we make the Ionic a fair competitor and get the fair share of that market rather than focus on the 2.87 share hybrid market. You know, how do we make it part of that 2.1 million uh, market that's over 10%, I believe, of the market? Uh, how do we make sure that this is in that consideration list? That's really the way to break hmm. through. Yeah, having driven that, I mean, I, th I think that's, uh, no disrespect, but I think it's more fun to drive than the Elantra. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't had the chance to drive it yet, but yeah. uh, tomorrow. I, I get to drive it tomorrow, too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's- Looking it's, forward it's, to that. It, it's it's a wonderful car. I mean, and I, I think the point is is that, you know, when we get to drive different types of powertrain vehicles, I mean, I think that we're sort of spoiled in this regard that you know we have all these different opportunities. But you know, to the to the point that when there's transparency and you and you just are focused on the performance you're getting from the car versus what may or may not be under the hood of the car, I think that makes all the difference. And uh, and you know, I mean, the execution here is just. You know, it's seamless. I mean, you just, yeah. you One of the interesting things we did, and you'll see it when you drive the car, is that uh, we have a sport mode for the Ionic Hybrid, and uh, it completely changes the character of the car, and it even changes the IP. So we put a tack there, we, we completely change the image of it, so you know you're in the sport mode, both color and the graphics and the, and the information display as well. But more importantly is that uh, it really accentuates the driving character of the car, so it basically is a, a two personality car. So for those customers that really are focused on MPG maximization, they drive in the normal mode. For those customers that want to just have a, a, a great compact car, they drive it in the sport mode. And, it, and it'll drive, you know, basically as, as well as any compact car out there. We've got a lot, a lot of questions coming in here. We ought to get to a couple of them before we have to take another quick break. Uh, you've touched on it, but uh, here uh, after hours guest 014 wants to know, who are the Ionics competitors? Well, well, Prius, I, obviously. Obviously, the Prius, and of course, for the uh, plug-in, the, the Volt will be a competitor. Obviously, the Bolt will be a competitor for the EV. Uh, you know, the, uh, there'll be a number of other cars coming to market in the EV space soon. You know, of course, now there's the Focus and there's the uh, uh, VW uh, 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 product as well. It's just been uh, refreshing, and I think it has virtually the same. I think they're 125 mile range for their EV and we're 124, which is basically the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're going to have those on the EV side. And of course, Volt will be a big competitor and Prius Prime on the plug-in side. And of course, there's a range of hybrids uh, on, uh, you know, the, the Ionic hybrid side, uh, Prius being the number one uh, in the market. And I've sold, I think, around 100, a little over 120,000 last year of that product. Uh, but more importantly, as I've said a few times, our dream is to make this a competitor against core compact cars. That's our dream, gasoline power cars. So cruise, focus. Yes, that's what we'd love to see is more cross shopping with those cars. Sounds like uh, down the road it could actually replace the Elantra then. I mean, it, if they're right on top of each other. Well, as, as uh, all manufacturers move into the next decade, you know, you're gonna see more and more electrified powertrains and of course product strategies will adjust for that. Uh, our Elantra definitely, we have a very large uh, loyal owner base for Elantra. Uh, it's done very well for us. We continue to do very well with that car. This past month, we again had a great month for Elantra. That's your number so, one selling car. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a great great design car. It has a tremendous uh, you know NVH and ride quality and good fuel economy. So it's a, it's a great balanced car uh, for people that uh, you know want that classic car and on that in that budget level. So you know it's always going to do well for us. But I think this car this category for us Ionics is going to be a growing area for us. It's going to continue to grow as we move into the future. Real good. You know, uh, we should take another quick break right now. we got a lot more to get to, including Dr. Data. But, uh, Carmen, why don't we show them one of those 37-second car reviews that we're doing these days?
This is 37 seconds in the Autoline Garage. The Honda Clarity fuel cell car is like most electrics. Whisper quiet, great road holding, and plenty of giddy up off the line. But it does lose a bit of oomph at higher speeds. You get 366 miles on a full tank and can refill it with hydrogen in under five minutes. Take that, all you battery electrics. Room for five, decent trunk room, and all the options you could ever think to ask for. Lease it for $369 a month, but that includes fifteen dollars worth of free fuel. The one problem is you can only get it in California. This has been 37 seconds in the Autoline Garage. So there you go. There's our 37-second car review. And in fact, we got a bunch more on our website. You can check them all out if you happen to like what we're doing there. But this is always the time of the show where we turn to Dr. Data. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm, I'm very interested. I didn't realize you were Chicago, and so in some ways this is appropriate for you. So Carmen, please bring up the um, first slide. Okay, so we have... 0.1 seconds going to 0.3 seconds. What might that be? The time between you hit the accelerator and the brake at a city center like Chicago. <laughs> Close. That is the amount, you, you, right now when the light turns green, you nail it. Now you should wait three tenths of a second before you nail it. The amount of time from when uh, something happens in front of you that requires a stop and the time it takes for you to actually do something about it. Mm, cold. All right. <laughs> so please bring up the answer. Oh. So Chicago has 151 cameras at intersections. And what they're doing is they're extending the grace period by two-tenths of a second. And we should add, these cameras are, if you run a red light, boom, they got you with so, the camera. So, so right? and it was very interesting to, to read about how these things work. I never, I never realized this, but they actually have radar. So radar detects the cars that are coming toward the intersection, and if you blow the red light, then there's video and still images taken of your vehicle, and they send you a ticket in the mail. So, so basically, for whatever reason, they just thought they'd be, they'd be very generous by giving up two-tenths of a second, and this just happened recently. So, uh, of course, I also was reading that uh, I guess there was a big controversy in Chicago that uh, the vendor that was providing the uh, red light cameras was, was, was getting, like, money, and they ended up having to pay a $20 million fine hmm. for... Uh, hmm. so. Wow. <laughs> but I thought it was also interesting that it, it, it isn't a moving violation. It's like a parking ticket. Yeah, you oh, just so you don't get points. You, well, you don't get the right to confront your accuser. You just get an envelope in the mail, right? You just <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's another road tax. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not a slap on the wrist like you know a corrective measure. You get pulled over, and do you know what you did back there? It's you know weeks later this envelope appears, and you're oh, I just have to pay this. Right. I don't know what happened, you know, but clearly I was driving then, and I can't think about what I did wrong, probably. And it goes to whom the car is registered to, so. Yeah, if you're and you, so that burden of proof is on you, I think, to prove that you weren't the one driving it. I mean, hopefully that, you know, they can see. Has this reduced people running red lights? Has this reduced accidents at intersections? So there's been studies on this for years, going both ways, back and forth. And the, the argument I've always had is, why don't you just lengthen the yellow a little bit? You know, and, okay, and so here's an answer to the question that you should, why not make the yellow light longer? Changing signal timings will not solve the problems of drivers running red light. The purpose of the yellow light is to warn drivers that the light is turning red. It is not intended to promote speeding or risk taking. Yeah, no, I mean. And, you, and to your point, they actually did show statistically that it is, it is reduced like T-bone accidents by 11% and injury. I mean, so, so there is see, data that. Seen studies yeah. both ways because you also have people that grow accustomed to those cameras being there, they know they're there. So in situations where a normal person might try and run the light or, you know, beat the light, run on an amber, they'll slam on the brakes. And that creates a rear end, you know, collision because the person behind them was expecting them to go and they didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember when the chimsel, the center high mounted stop lamp came out and NHTSA said this is going to eliminate rear enders. <laughs> and I, I think today it, there's no measurable or very little measurable difference having a chimsel on a car. People just get used to it. You know, the thing that I thought was interesting, though, is, is that, you know, as, as we're talking, we're talking here about advanced vehicles, um, that if 
these intersections all have radar. Isn't this going to lend itself to switching to uh, vehicle to infrastructure communications? So the car will be able to talk to the intersection and, and maybe tell you to slow down or maybe apply the brakes like the uh, situation with the Cherokee. Certainly a major thing. component of autonomy is going to be uh, the vehicle through the dedicated short range radio mm -hmm. that's been, uh, that will be mandated. Uh, it's already offered on a couple models now. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that device, that low uh, powered modem will be able to talk not only to infrastructure, it'll talk to stoplights, you could talk to uh, other parts of infrastructure, parking for example, if you want to find a parking spot. But it, more importantly, we'll talk to cars in front of it, mm -hmm. and to cars behind it, and cars beside it. So it can anticipate uh, that when the car in front of me slows down, it sends a signal to the, to the rear, says, hey, you guys, you better start slowing down now, because I'm slowing down. So, so, will the, so will your car slow down by itself, or will it... In a world of autonomy, yes. So not only, so in, this, in the stages we're in today, we use dedicated sensors in the vehicle to measure what's going on around us. In the future, we'll have those as well as uh, this vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. So I'll know, the car will know before the sensor knows that the, it's gonna slow down in front of me. Hmm. So the car in front of me will signal the slowdown as, uh, as it's initiated before the sensor has a chance to even pick it up. Hmm. Hey, we got a great question here that came in from our work. He says, I had a Prius and had to replace the battery at 100,000 miles uh, for 3,000 bucks. He says, is it necessary to trade in a hybrid before those points in time and mileage with the low trade-in value? Well, as I mentioned before, we have a lifetime warranty on our battery, so you, in our case, would not have to pay $3,000 or whatever the battery might cost. Uh, it, it'll be replaced as part of the warranty of the vehicle, so not to worry. There you go. What's the acceptable level of degradation? Because they do, you know, they do taper off over time. But there's got to be that hard point at which you say, well, you know, you only get 80% of the range, or, or what's, the, what's the metric? So on hybrids, you're really not going to know until there's a failure because it's masked by the gasoline engine. And on the plug-in hybrid, even, uh, the battery, you're not using, remember the, some of the best technology to managing battery life is one, cooling, but the other is this management of state of charge and discharge, and both the rate as well as the level. So by managing the state of charge and discharge in a specific range, you can maximize range. As the battery ages, you can expand those limits. Mm -hmm. And so the actual usable range by the customer can still be the same as the vehicle ages. So uh, in the battery electric vehicle, the pure battery electric vehicle is the one where you're gonna notice it. And uh, I don't know the exact figures, but obviously there is gonna be some level of acceptable degradation within you know, what's considered a customer acceptable range. I'm not sure what those figures are at this moment. Does the software increase those those boundaries? Yeah, it itself? uses the measured parameters measured by uh, the vehicle computers from the battery pack itself. So uh, a number of manufacturers employ that technology so they can give a consistent customer experience and they're adjusting the battery limits as the vehicle uh, ages. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. What do you make of 48 volt hybrids? We've had a number of shows where we've discussed that you know, supposedly 80% of the benefits of a strong hybrid, like you've got here with the Ionic, at 20% of the cost. You know, there's no doubt there's going to be a lot more electrification that's coming. And uh, the challenge with 48 volt isn't what you mentioned, it's the part that we don't talk about, and that's that basically all of the vehicle systems have to be converted at some point, otherwise you have very expensive inverters and other things that have to modify the output of the... What you're saying is instead of a 12-volt system, the whole car is going to be converted to 48. Eventually. Now, there'll be the, 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 all the 48 cars that will be coming in the near term will have basically two systems. They'll have a 48-volt system and a 12-volt system. But that's not the cheapest way or the best way to do it. And so now you're looking at this entire industry where components are all 12-volt. And eventually, they're going to have to shift. So this is everything from light bulbs to the radio. Radio, to HVAC controllers and electromechanical devices, like right. door lock actuators, and you know all these components in the car we take for granted. And so it's going to be, I think, a long, long-term uh, switch if, in fact, it happens. And, of course, then you have to think about the aftermarket industry. What happens when you call AAA 
Uh, where's the 48 volt jump start? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit. So you have to have another inverter in the car to allow someone with a with a uh, a tow truck operator could jump start your car with a 12 volt jump instead of a 48 volt. So there's a lot of things that we have to consider. But uh, when you think about mild hybridization, it has to happen because the miracle of hybridization are really two things. One is the ability to recapture essentially wasted energy on braking. How do I recapture that energy of heat that, or friction that's created when I hit the brake pedal and then grab that energy and store it and then reuse it again? Uh, that's the first miracle of hybridization. The second one is the ability to downsize the gasoline engine so it operates in a more efficient range consistently. Because as we know, uh, about the least efficient range for gasoline engine operators is light throttle. It's very inefficient. So the, when you downsize, you're going to operate in a more efficient range. And that's really the second uh, miracle of hybridization. So any kind of mild hybridization is going to allow recapturing of brake energy, some uh, acceleration assist, and the ability to downsize the gasoline engine as a result of that. So it's coming, whether we call it 48 volts or something else. Mm -hmm. So like other companies, we're looking at 48 volt. Uh, we're looking at other things, too, that might deliver you know, even better result. So I think it's going to be a number of different solutions that come, come to the party. What might give a better result? Well, there's obviously a lot going on in terms of overall cost reduction and hybrid technologies, just the overall. Uh, and so you just look at the Ionic, one of the very clever things that was done with this car that's not done with any other hybrid in the market today. Our engineers thought, why do we have a 110-year-old lead-acid battery in the car? Every hybrid car in the market has this really advanced battery pack, and then they have this old lead-acid battery that you could buy at, at uh, Pep Boys. And you wonder, why do we have that? It's heavy. It doesn't last a long time. You, it's unnecessary. So we redesigned our, we designed our system to get rid of that battery. And so we use one of the modules, one section of the lithium ion battery pack to basically boot up and run all the basic vehicle systems and uh, allow yourself to eliminate the weight, the cost, complexity, and, uh, and basically space, you know, the, the space that it used up for that, they call them auxiliary batteries in the hybrid field. See, so a, there's going to be continued advances in terms of finding ways to do things smarter and cheaper. That's a very clear, very communicable uh, benefit to this vehicle, to the consumer. So if, if I were your marketing guys and I were listening right now, I'd say, this is a car where you never, ever have to replace the battery, the, you know, the accessory battery. Essentially, don't have to worry. Now, think about it. The number one and two reasons that you're going to be stranded on the road to, well, the three, you're going to run out of gas, you're going to have a flat tire, or your car won't start because the battery's dead, right? So we eliminated one of them. One of the three reasons that probably covers well over 90% of the, uh, you know, down so, the road. So why won't the battery die? Because we can always use a portion of the hybrid. It'll move. We could use a portion of the lithium-ion hybrid pack to boot up the systems. Let's talk a bit about product planning. Yeah, I mean, you run all that. How do you guys possibly figure out what you should be doing, what you can afford to do? You can't do it all, even though Hyundai's doing an awful lot. You know, how do you set your priorities of saying, here's the strategy we got to follow? You know, no company, uh, including ours, has unlimited resources. We all have to kind of pick and choose where we're going to put our R&D dollars. Uh, and we have to think about, as planners, where is the potential for the best and most likely uh, market movement? Uh, and then choose to overemphasize our R&D efforts in those areas. Uh, and that's really the challenge is how do we anticipate uh, things that are going to happen in the future? When you look at Ionic as a great example of that, you know, by the time you know, 10 years pass, more than 40% of the market will be millennials. The boomers are going to be more or less moving out of the market. They're going to be declining at a very rapid rate. Their interest in electrified vehicles far surpasses all of our interests, our generations. Uh, and so those buyers are much more interested. They're much more accepting of these technologies. They grew up with electronic devices all around them from the day they were born. And so for them, it's natural. Uh, when you think about urbanization, they, they want to live in big cities, millennials, at a much higher rate than all of us here in this room. They want to live uh, in uh, much closer proximity to their friends and the things they do after hours. And so they're going to live in smaller places with less and smaller parking spots. So they're going to have to have vehicles that do more things for them. They'll be, have to be more versatile. So this kind of a body design might appeal to them more because they could do more with this design than they could with a conventional sedan with a trunk. 
the third thing is multi-generational living. That's growing at a very fast pace that we've never seen before. And so you're going to have your, your mom and dad maybe live with you. Your kids are going to stay with you longer. And so you have to have a vehicle that holds more and does more than the vehicles that are being replaced today in the market. So we have to look at all of those kinds of trends and think about how is that going to shape the market, not just in terms of vehicle mix, you know, CUV and sedan, for example, but what are the characteristics people are going to want and how do we invest in those characteristics? And so very early on, you know, as you remember, we were the first to come to market with uh, Android Auto. And it was a recognition that millennials focus their life around the phone and that really their phone is, becomes their, their, their book, the things they use to organize their life and to really make day-to-day -day decisions every minute of the day. And so how do you take that device and do it in a way that there's minimal distraction in the driving environment? How do you do it in a way that allows a customer to interact? So we have all the advantages of Android Auto with you know, a voice to text and text to voice when they're incoming and, and so on. So uh, we're, we focus our engineering efforts on those trends. And we have a really good pe group of folks in our office that just focus continuously on, on cultural and societal and regulatory trends that are going to shape the industry and then try and convert those into, you know, R&D emphasis uh, areas. We work with our offices here in Ann Arbor uh, very closely in those areas. Do you see changes in vehicle architectures in order to address some of these things, Be you know, going beyond the powertrain thing? Absolutely. And you could see it with CUV. So CUV is a body shape that really came from people's uh, desire for more confidence with a high seating position, uh, one. Uh, the image of safety that comes along with higher ground clearance, you know, that if I hit a truck hole, it's not going to damage the car. And there's a sense of extra durability that comes from that body shape. Uh, but also there's a sense, it's just it's more durable, it's more safe and more durable. Uh, and then of course the final thing, the obvious one, is it has the image of being able to do more things. It carries more stuff, it can go more places. And so it's really not so much about CUV popularity, it's about the aspects of CUV that customers want. More versatility, more space, more sense of safety and durability that they get with that, that comes all along with that body shape. Mm -hmm. Hey, we got a lot more questions to get to here, but we got to take another quick break. Again, here's another company that makes this show possible. Let's give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. Okay, we're back talking to Mike O'Brien, the head of product planning at Hyundai Motor America. Mike, one of the, the, the news stories that broke this week, in fact, Gary, this was one of the ones you wanted to bring up in this discussion is Dieter Zetsche came out and pretty much said at Daimler, they're backing off fuel cell development because they want to accelerate their battery electric program by three years. You facing any kind of issues like that at Hyundai? Well, there's a great example of R&D prioritization. Nobody has unlimited resources, so, you know, it sounds like their choice was to take engineering resources and move them over to the electrification side. My, my personal opinion is that when you think about uh, pure zero carbon personal mobility, uh, right now, the current battery technology that we know today doesn't cover the entire light vehicle market. It's not practical to have a battery electric F-250 or Silverado 2500. It's not practical to have a large vehicle class like a full-size SUV with a, uh, a pure battery electric alternative just because of the energy density and the recharge time, the weight, uh, the power, per, uh, power performance potential. And so when you think about hydrogen, when you think about the power density, when you think about refueling time, when you think about range, you think about all the things that people think about when they, or take for granted, frankly, with a gasoline engine, they're the same. So a, a hydrogen powertrain can be in any vehicle in the current light vehicle fleet and frankly, heavy duty fleet, buses, heavy duty trucks, basically the same storage space for the fuel, the same refueling time, the same power performance, the same range. And so I could transition from a carbon-based energy source to a potentially zero carbon base. Now, there's always going to be an argument about where that hydrogen comes from, just like there's always the same argument of where the electricity comes from. And so we as a, a society have to find more ways to create hydrogen or electricity from either renewable or zero carbon sources. One of the, a very interesting experiment in the state of California was, uh, was created by the University of California, Irvine, where they have a uh, uh, hydrogen developed from human waste. So the Orange County... Uh, sanitation district has uh, recently, they just concluded their experiment, but they were producing hydrogen from methane that was vented uh, and it allowed them to power the uh, 
the waste facility, sanitation station, 80% of the electrical power came from that hydrogen production. The other 20% was used to fuel all the hydrogen vehicles in Southern California. And so there you have money found on the ground, something for nothing. Everybody has Literally to eat. Found on the ground. Everybody has to eat. And so now <laughs> we're taking something, some hydrogen. <laughs> something, you know, something that allows us to take what previously is a carbon producing waste product and turn it into something that's useful for everybody. So there's going to be more of these solutions coming. And the question is uh, really infrastructure for hydrogen. Mm. So uh, as many regulators like to say, everybody has a plug. And so that that pretends that uh, you know elect, uh, pure battery electric or plug-ins maybe have a very bright future in the near term because everybody has a plug. Of course, that's everybody but people that live in dense urban areas, live in high rises, and yeah. you know you can imagine a high rise cords. in Manhattan with a couple of hundred or thousand uh, extension cords coming out of the windows, coming down the side of the building. So it's obviously going to help a lot of folks that have a plug, but some people you know have other needs. They want a bigger vehicle. Uh, they don't necessarily live in an area where they have a garage or a place to charge. So uh, there's going to be space for all of these energy types in the market. And I think uh, you're going to see more growth in hydrogen. I think it's uh, really the limit of growth is going to be the same as it was 100 years ago uh, when, uh, as other technologists have pointed out, that in the very beginning of the gasoline era, guess where you purchased gasoline? You bought it in one-gallon tin containers at the pharmacy. That's right. And so there was a time when gasoline was a niche fuel, uh, and it wasn't the core fuel. Electricity and steam were the were the core fuels, and so really infrastructure is the biggest limiting factor with hydrogen right now. And the question is, can can we accelerate that quickly enough? Is mm -hmm. is it viable for automakers to take on some of that burden to to increase the infrastructure? I think one of the main reasons why Tesla has captured you know, America's and the world's uh, attention is that they took that infrastructural burden in, uh, on themselves in part and created the supercharger network. Um, and even if it isn't actually something that everybody can use all the time, it's that safety net of knowing that I could go there. Um, and they also get the, uh, the byproduct of looking like a good corporate citizen for providing you know, free, free energy and, and, and mobility. Part. Well, not in the future, right? And that, that's going to be a problem. But I'm, I'm wondering if... And we should point out that, that you guys actually have fuel cell vehicles, Tucson's, mm -hmm. that... We've been you, selling that vehicle for quite a while right. now, and uh, our customers are very happy with it. I think, to answer your question directly, there's maybe two issues. One is, uh, you know, the energy industry has been at this for well over 100 years. They understand logistics, they understand safety, they understand cost reduction, they understand quality. So... Uh, it's difficult for an automaker to all of a sudden become a really a competitive player in the energy field. Mm -hmm. And so just as it would probably be equally unrealistic for one of the big energy companies to all of a sudden become a car manufacturer. Uh, so that's one challenge that we have to think about. The other challenge is when you reg regarding Tesla in particular is that uh, is the issue of scale up. So would that would that model work if you're talking about selling millions of vehicles as opposed to selling tens of thousands of vehicles. I think they're going to find out very quickly that it, it doesn't work. So, um, you know, when, when they get with the Model 3, I think you're going to create bottlenecks there that it's going to be a big problem. Um, Everybody's got a plug. <laughs> my, my other thought is that, you know, the rise of autonomy um, could help with the infrastructure problem somewhat. Because if you don't have to find that one hydrogen station, you can just have the vehicle programmed to go there in between runs, then it, it takes away some of the burden of, uh, you know, the time lost going back and forth. It could. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a very interesting industry to watch. You know, obviously there's merits with battery electric vehicles, and we're very excited about those with the Ionic. Uh, and we'll have more coming beyond that. And of course, we've been a long-term player, uh, you know, almost 20 years now in the hydrogen field. And Certainly, when you think about the entire light vehicle market and covering you know, everybody's needs, hydrogen certainly has a promising future, especially when you think about bigger vehicles. And mm -hmm. that was part of what drove our choice to do our first uh, uh, hydrogen vehicles, a CUV, just to exaggerate the point that it's not limited to smaller vehicle types. We can make a larger vehicle type with hydrogen. And, and to your point, they're even talking class 7, class 8 semis, maybe sure. going hydrogen, to your very point, because you can't do it with batteries. Yeah, and, and American consumers may not know this, but Hyundai has a whole portfolio of, of heavy trucks already, right? I mean, you've got, mm -hmm. uh, you've got buses. You also have um, you know, vehicles the size of Ford Transits, and we're seeing more influx of, of those types of vehicles here, here in the U.S. Is that an area of you know, opportunity for Hyundai? 
Well, uh, you know, when you think about the fleet market and heavy heavy vehicle market, you know, those customers really rely on, they like to have one manufacturer and one retail outlet to do their business. And, you know, for us to enter that market is obviously a big commitment in terms of having a lineup of products, not just one or two products. So that's certainly not something that we're thinking about in the near term, but we're always looking at it because, as you mentioned, we do have a full lineup of products globally. Hey, we've got a, a bunch of questions here. We're, we're coming down towards the end of the show, and I ought to shoot them at you rapid fire. And uh, just because people took the time to write all this, guest 14 wants to know who's the target audience for the Ionic? Who you want to sell this to? Anybody looking at a high volume compact car is their next purchase. Royal with Cheese says, Has Hyundai, I know the answer to this one, has Hyundai ever considered getting into the highly profitable light truck market in the U.S.? Sure, we think about it every day. <laughs> <laughs> you had a concept car at the Detroit show a couple of years ago. We uh, did. Uh, concept Santa, truck, Santa right. Yeah, exactly. We're working very hard on that concept. That is, to me, a great example of uh, some really bright people that we're very fortunate to have in our company that envision this future where, you know what, in every category of vehicle in the United States, you have about the same split of men and women, you know, 55% men, 45% women. And let's face it, uh, even though they might only buy 45%, they're probably driving 85% of the decision making. There's only two categories where that's not true. One of them is pickup, where about 80% of the buyers are men, and the other one's supercar, <laughs> for the obvious reasons. And so, naturally, and I can give you 10 more examples of reasons why there's an unmet market need for an open bed utility product, a truck product, that's not made or sold in this market today. Uh, parking, maneuverability, fuel economy, people that just want to keep their dirty stuff separate from where they put their kids' child seats. Do you really want to put your kid on top of a bunch of mud and dirt from your plate things over the weekend? Uh, you want to have a nice place to put things, whether it's uh, dirt bikes, it's a mountain bikes, it's a kayak, uh, hockey equipment. You want to have the outdoor activities that urban dwellers, more and more of these millennials will be living in an urban lifestyle but they want to have a vacation on the weekends. They want to break away from that, and they want to have fun somewhere. They don't need to tow 12,000 pounds. They don't need to be able to haul several thousand pounds. They just want to take their stuff and enjoy life outside of the urban uh, environment. And they may want to go to Home Depot and buy plants or some other things like that. They don't need a big vehicle to do that that's difficult to maneuver and difficult to park. The very reasons why uh, female buyers avoid pickups. So. This product, I think, has a tremendous amount of potential. And, uh, You're talking about a pickup for women. Well, we're talking about a pickup for a lot of people that don't consider pickups, frankly. Okay. Very that, interesting. That, um, so just to be clear, the Santa Cruz as a product is still very much on the table. You're still looking. We're working very hard on a concept like that one, yes. Uh, nothing to announce yet, but it's something that we're very actively working on. Fantastic. Tony Gray wants to know... Uh, I hope Hyundai has learned, this is a comment, not a question, has learned from their styling retreat and will put passion back in the next generation. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a comment for you. Uh, let's see, Mark Kay wants to know, how soon when we, will we see proper showrooms for Genesis and when are we going to see an SUV? Well, I'd say wait about a week on the second part of the question. And oh. on the first part of the question, uh, remember, People that are fluent don't have to make compromises. And of course, having to visit a showroom in order to get your servicing done, uh, to purchase your car, isn't always the best use of your time. So of course, the showroom is going to be a very important of our Genesis uh, project uh, and our Genesis product lineup. On the other hand, the whole ownership experience is the most important part. So how do we make owning personal mobility for people that can make any choice they want better. And it's all about time and it's about respect for their time and making the availability of this transportation exactly what they want, when they want it, with the least amount of intrusiveness in their lives. So we're going to focus on all the things around ownership that makes it easier for them and, and more pleasant for them to have their own uh, uh, premium luxury product that uh, has the least intrusive effect on their daily lives, meaning it doesn't you, we have valet service, and we'll come to your home to demonstrate the vehicle or your work. Uh, we'll you never have to go to the dealership if you want to buy a, a right. Genesis. And so, so I really believe that in the world that we live in today, if, if, 
If you were to think about how I would invest in the automotive retail space 25 years ago compared to today, would I have the same level of investment on the brick and mortar? Or would I be investing some of that money differently when you think about the digital world and how all of us right here do our business every day? How much of us are buying on, whether it's eBay or Amazon, uh, every day on our phones? And we're trying, we're doing things on the fly, on the run. We don't want to have to go somewhere necessarily to transact. We want to do it where we're at. And so the whole investment model for the automotive retail industry, I think, is going to change, whether it's for affluent buyers or for, for core buyers. And so we have to think about that. It's not just a brick and mortar question. No, you're right. And, and, and I would hasten to add that Lincoln is going through the same thing, even though it has standalone stores. You don't have to go to the store at all to buy a Lincoln these days. Yep. Uh, J.D. Clough wants to know, talking about the Ionic here, how does the, the powertrain compare to the Kia Nero's? Uh, very similar, uh, but keep in mind, I believe we have either, I think we have an 8 or 9 MPG uh, EPA rated advantage. We also uh, have a much larger cabin space, so our, our total uh, EPA interior volume is much larger than the Nero. As it is, it's also larger than Prius. So, uh, uh, so we have a, a bigger interior cabin and a much higher fuel economy rating. Okay, last question here. Dan Barry says, at the Seoul Auto Show, it was announced that Hyundai and Kia would release two SUV crossover EVs with more than 300 kilometers range. He says, I, it, this would suggest it would require a 50 kilowatt or larger battery pack. Am I in the right ballpark? Probably too, a little too early to announce, but stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Anything else? Oh, we could go on for hours. I know, I know. I, we, we could. So any last question there, Chris? What have you learned from the development of this vehicle that you will be applying to other vehicles in the lineup? You talked about thermal efficiency, so there are mechanical things. There's probably aerodynamic things. Uh, maybe there's just uh, workflow things. Many of these things are going to trickle down to our other products. Of course, this is our technology tour de force. But when you think about uh, whether it's lightweighting with the interior plastics using, uh, you know, volcanic rock as a major uh, fundamental component, uh, whether it's our soy-based uh, interior fabrics and interior coverings that improve recyclability and reduction on petrochemicals in the production of the vehicle, or uh, whether it's lightweighting in uh, light alloy aluminum and and a uh, hood and deck lid. So all, you can imagine all those things are going to be trickling down to other products in the future. Hey, one, one more thing. Okay, so this, the, the hybrid, is available now? Correct. And when will the plug-in and the EV versions be available? So the EV is available now. We're just starting to receive deliveries uh, from our factories. Uh, the uh, Ionic Hybrid is, is available now. It's arriving at dealers today. Uh, the plug-in hybrid uh, will be arriving at our dealerships around September of this year. And will these be 50-state vehicles? Yes, the plug-in will be a 50-state availability. Now, remember, any of our cars are 50-state availability, but because of the ZEV regulations, there's incentives for those states that promote their sale much more. So for the EV, the initial availability will just be uh, California because that's where there's a lot of incentives, and then uh, there's a lot more uh, infrastructure as well for fast charge, uh, DC fast charge. Remember, the Ionic EV with a DC fast charge is less than half an hour to uh, uh, over 80% charge. So we're going to have the same kind of capability as uh, our well-known competitors have in terms of fast charge. And so, uh, and those fast chargers are mostly right now in California. Mm -hmm. So we'll focus on that initially with the EV until, you know, infrastructure is uh, building. But any dealer in the United States can order any of these cars and make it available to any of their customers if they choose to have one. Mm -hmm. With that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Michael Bryan, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a fascinating discussion, a really good show. Much appreciate your time here today. Thank you very much for having us here today, and uh, I look forward to being here again soon. Good deal. Chris Pocker, thanks for stopping by, man. Love talking cars. Great to be here. Yeah, good to have you. And Gary, we'll keep on doing this. Yes, we will. want to thank all of you for having tuned in today. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.